ever feel as though you were born in the wrong country, like you would thrive in some other kind of economy or culture? Well, I'd argue to say that that problem goes far beyond just the real world. So within the confines of anime, there's been numerous people who were born into the wrong universe or the wrong country within their own universe. And of all the anime I could think of, I think Naruto quite honestly has the most examples of people who were born in the wrong country. See, there is multiple people within the confines of Naruto who, if born in a different village or country, would have had dramatically different lives. People who may be considered weak in the village that they currently reside in, who would have been gods in other villages. People who have had incredibly horrible backstories, who would have lived relatively normal lives in other villages. People who were corrupted by evil in the villages they were born into, but would have become heroes in other villages. And today, I want to go over some of those examples. See, I genuinely believe that a lot of characters within Naruto could have had much more interesting stories if they were born somewhere else. Characters who were considered memes could have been legitimate menaces elsewhere. But before we get to talking about these zero to hero stories, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And while you're at it, if you want to see me go from zero to leader of anime on YouTube, guys, you're going to have to go ahead and follow my other YouTube channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking Naruto, I talk literally any other anime. We're getting into One Punch Man now. I'm thinking about doing an Akame Got Kill video. Ninja Must Die is the closest I've ever felt to being a ninja in the Naruto world. Ninja Must Die is a revolutionary mobile game. It revolutionizes combat running gameplay by integrating side scrolling and action all into one game. It's an action packed mobile platforming game that features distinct ink painting visuals. Jump into the world to tackle epic bosses and solve incredible puzzles in the ninja realm. Play as characters like like Kuro, a young and passionate boy who believes in the power of the ninja, with his ninjutsu Dragon Gunfire, or Dragon Flame Waltz, or Pepper, a brand new ninja recently added to the game, an energetic, hot-tempered character with explosive powers that come in the form of her Phoenix Flame Ninjutsu. You can play as these characters in a multitude of different game modes, like 3v3 or other multiplayer game modes. And while the long list of characters and all the different ninjutsu that come along with them might seem a little intimidating, the game means easy and intuitive. On just one smartphone with just one finger, this game can be played easily. The easy controls make the incredible action of this game simple to achieve, and you can play with all of your friends. As in the world of Ninja Must Die, you can make interdimensional connections with other ninjas. You could be your friend's apprentice or their sensei, or you could start a clan together. And these social connections between players are actually a core fundamental part of the Ninja Must Die playstyle, as things like bounties and clan warfare are a massive part of the game. But don't worry, if you're not looking to do clan wars, there's an incredible story in Ninja Must Die. The story progresses in an interlocking and perilous way, combining the progression of the plot with actual combat, giving the player the most possible immersion into the story. So what are you guys waiting for? Download Ninja Must Die using the link in my description right now. It's about time we start living like the ninjas we all know we are. So birthplaces. Sometimes you love them, sometimes you grow to hate them. You feel as though if you were born somewhere else, you could have thrived in a different environment. With a different culture, you'd be understood better. There could be places where people focus on the things that you like to focus on, and if you were born there, you would have been perfect. While this is absolutely a problem that people struggle with in the real world, it is also a problem that people sort of struggle with in the Naruto world. See, this idea came to me through an Instagram DM, weirdly enough. Though not the whole idea, just the idea of the first entry on this list. See, when I say the name 1010, you probably think fastest person in fiction, less screen time than a swing, kind of useless character. And for any of those thoughts, you'd be absolutely correct. She's so fast that the animators weren't able to draw her tauntaun on Shizune's pig and Naruto's swing all have more screen time than her. And for all intents and purposes, when compared to the rest of the Konoha 13, she is kind of useless. But this is because Ten Ten has a very specific set of abilities. See, Ten Ten is a weapons genius. And within the confines of real ninjas, that would be an incredibly powerful ability. Because at the end of the day, that's really all ninjas have. Ten Ten's fighting style relies heavily on the fact that she seals thousands of kunais and different ninja tools away in scrolls. Ten Ten then unseals these weapons and hurls them at enemies. Ten Ten is the ninja world version of a Gatling gun. An unending volley of ninja tools fired in an 
an enemy relatively accurately. Because here's the thing, Tenten Shuriken Jutsu was actually rather impressive. Well, it may seem as though she's just firing kunai and shuriken in any direction, she's been noted several times during the manga and the anime to be incredibly accurate. But Tenten is actually a lot more than just her scrolls. Tenten has an innate and relatively rare ability to be able to master any weapon she picks up. And I mean, literally any weapon. This is fully put on display during the fourth great Shinobi World War. This was seen when Ten Ten used the Jinanda. See, the Jinanda is a massive spike ball flare with explosive tags inside of it. The explosions from the explosive tags launch the spike ball in a direction that Ten Ten wants to launch it, giving Ten Ten the ability to swing a massive spike ball flail at anybody she wants at incredibly high speeds. Ten Ten was able to master this relatively unwieldy and incredibly large weapon in a matter of no time whatsoever. Whatsoever. But this wasn't even the greatest example of 1010 mastering high level weaponry instantly. See, also during the fourth great Shinobi World War, 1010 was able to get her hands on the Basho Sen. The Basho Sen is one of the weapons of the Sage of Six Paths, previously wielded by Kinkaku and Ginkaku. This weapon, when swung, is able to generate a massive amount of any of the five basic elemental natures. So you can swing the Basho Sen, which is just a fan, and generate a massive amount of fire, water, wind, lightning, ground. But the thing is, as it is one of the Sage of Six Paths, treasured tools, it requires an insane amount of chakra to use, and thus is considered one of the hardest weapons in the entirety of the Naruto universe to wield. And yet, in a matter of seconds, Ten Ten was able to pick it up, understand how it works, and use it. And while using it once basically drained her of all of her chakra, being able to pick up a weapon which was previously wielded by the Sage of Six Paths, and currently wielded by Kinkaku and Ginkaku, descendants of Hagoromo, and use it instantly proves Ten Ten's genius. And here's the thing, in the later stages of Konoha, this moveset may seem like a meme because there's two people who can quite literally generate massive chakra max. And therefore of the Konoha 13, if Ten Ten's not the weakest, she's the second weakest. But there's places that Ten Ten with this moveset would be considered one of the strongest people in the village's history. And the best example of a place where she would be considered one of the strongest ninjas in the village's history is the hidden mist. See, while there's a lot of villages where weapons play a crucial role in the power of the ninja, like the hidden sand with their puppets or the land of iron with their chakra blades, there is arguably no better place for Ten Ten to be placed then the Hidden Mist. See, in the Hidden Mist history, the strongest warriors are elected to join the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, which are obviously Seven Swordsmen who wield the Seven Swords of the Mist. And while you can make the argument that Ten Ten would never be considered strong enough to actually be elected to join the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, if she were to make it to the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, she would be very similar to two characters in Naruto's history. See, within the confines of Naruto, only two characters have tried to wield more than one of the Seven Swords of the the Mist, and that was the two Hozuki brothers, Mangetsu and Suigetsu. And amongst the lore of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, Mangetsu is considered to be a legend, as he was known to have collected all Seven Swords of the Mist and wield every single one of them with proficiency. In fact, Mangetsu is revered with such a level of respect that Suigetsu is basically trying to live Mangetsu's life. See, Suigetsu also wants to collect all Seven Swords of the Mist and wield them with proficiency. But the thing is, this is no easy task. Each of the Seven Swords, while being legendary in their own right are incredibly different from each other. One is a seven foot long hunk of iron meant for decapitating people, while the other is quite literally a sewing needle with infinite thread attached to the back of it. One is an axe and a hammer, and the other is an axe with an infinite amount of explosive tags. Collecting all seven of these weapons is hard enough, but being able to master every single one of them is a feat unto its own. And for all intents and purposes, there's really no reason to believe that Ten Ten couldn't have accomplished this feat. I mean, Ten Ten was able to wield one of the sacred tools of the Sage of Six Paths. Well, obviously each of legendary swords is in fact a legendary sword, there is no way it could be as hard to wield as the Basho Sen. Well, at least that's the situation for six of the swords. See, I believe that Tenten will be able to wield everything from the lightning swords to the executioner blade, to the sewing needle, to the skull cracker, everything except for maybe Samehara. See, Samehara is kind of a problem because Samehara has to choose its wielder. And Samehara only chooses wielders who have massive chakra signatures. Killer B, Kisame, and this is because Samehara is constantly draining the chakra of its wielder, using it to power itself if it's not taking chakra from other people. And considering the fact that Tenten was only able to swing the Basho Sen one time before draining her chakra makes me believe that Samehara probably wouldn't be the best fit with her. But still, if Tenten was born in the Hidden Mist, there's no reason to believe that she couldn't have A, joined the Seven Swords into the Mist, and B, 
wielded six of the swords, which would have put her in the same conversation as Mongetsu. And sure, would she still have most likely died at the hands of Might Die or something like that? Yeah, but she would have been a much stronger version of the 1010 that we know today. So I can't help but feel as though that maybe she was born in the wrong village. But enough about people who were born in Konoha who shouldn't have been born in Konoha. Let's talk about people who were born outside of Konoha, but should have been born in Konoha. I genuinely do not believe that there is a better example of somebody who was born outside of Konoha, but should have been born inside of Konoha than Hidan. You see, Hidan was born in the land of hot water, a hot springs town that was trying to get rid of its ninja because they're a hot springs town. Why do they need a hidden village? And unfortunately, they were beginning to demilitarize and get rid of their shinobi while Hidan was trying to become a shinobi. And this didn't sit right with Hidan because he wanted to become a shinobi. He wanted to be on the front lines in battle, enjoying the glory of war. And before you're like, oh yeah, that's because Hidan is a sociopath. No, that is a very common ideology among shinobi. In fact, it's quite literally the plot of Sakura's light novel, Shikamaru's second light novel, and a lot of Boruto. So Hidan, a ninja who wanted to be a ninja on the front lines of war, being born into a peaceful tourist village, it's pretty much the worst place he could have been born. But there's actually a much larger reason outside of that, that Hidan should have been born elsewhere. You see, Hidan was born without the ability to mold chakra, meaning that he couldn't do things like ninjutsu and genjutsu. In fact, Hidan's entire move set is boiled down to taijutsu and kenjutsu with his scythe. This isn't necessarily a problem for Hidan because of his immortality granted through Lord Jashin, but still, when I think of people who can't mold chakra and can't use ninjutsu and genjutsu, I really only think of one place, and that's Konoha. More specifically, Rock Lee and Mike Guy, who I know can use ninjutsu, but decides not to. See, from the days that Might Die, Mike Guy's father, the Eternal Genin, was around, Taijutsu only kind of became a strategy. That was so long as you trained in the Eight Gates. The power of only Taijutsu became very apparent when Might Die quite literally killed six out of seven members of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. And Might Guy, even though he could mold chakra, decided to train in the Eight Gates in service to his father who gave his life on honorably instead of focusing on ninjutsu or genjutsu. And this started a currently three generational line of people who train in the eight gates and don't focus on ninjutsu or genjutsu. And there's no reason to believe that if hypothetically Hidan was born into Konoha, that he couldn't have done this. Hidan's roughly Mike Guy's age, a couple years younger, and thus he most likely would have seen Mike Guy growing into a powerful figure as somebody who only trains in Taijutsu in the Eight Gates. A ninja who, despite his situation, is still getting to serve on the front lines and battle in all the wars. A shinobi getting to live a shinobi's dream. And thus Hidan, if born in Konoha, most likely would have ended up training in the Eight Gates. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, yes, but if he was born in Konoha, he never would have found Lord Jashin and he never would have got his immortality. But that's if you believe that there's actually a Lord Jashin. See, Hidan's the only Jashinist we've ever stumbled upon. In fact, in both Konoha Hidan and the Steam Ninja Scrolls, two light novels, Konoha has tried to look for other Jashinists. And while in the Steam Ninja Scrolls, they have found other Jashinists, those Jashinists didn't have immortality. They were simply trying to gain the immortality that they had seen Hidan have. So my personal theory is that Hidan made up Lord Jashin to make his immortality make more sense to it as a coping mechanism for killing all of his neighbors on his way out of the land of hot water. The reason that's important because within that theory, it states that Hidan is born with immortality, meaning that if he was born in Konoha, he would still have immortality. But even if hypothetically Hidan wasn't born with immortality, he would have got to live not only through the third great shinobi world war, but the fourth. And outside of the Great Wars, there also would have been a butt ton of ninja work he could have done where he could have killed and sacrificed ninjas from other villages. Would it have been the most ethically or morally great thing for Konoha to employ? Probably not. But we're not gonna sit here and act like Shinobi from Konoha haven't killed Shinobi from other villages for decades. How they go about it really isn't that big of a deal. And yes, obviously the tenets of Joshinism imply that Hidan has to kill the people he's closest to emotionally, but just throw him in the root and send him out as an assassin. Sai has killed over a thousand people and he worked alone. Train up Hidan in the Eight Gates, shove him in the root, forget about him forever, and you have the most powerful asset in Konoha's history. Hidan would hypothetically be able to open the Eight Gates numerous times. Because while I did initially make a video about how Hidan with the Eight Gates would be broken, except for the fact that after he activated the Eight Gates, his body would just be on fire forever, somebody in the comments 
very smartly pointed out that the eighth gate is centric around the heart, i.e. pumping all of your body's chakra to the heart. And the heart pumps so quickly that it basically lights your blood on fire. Someone in the comments stated that Hidan could just rip out his own heart, throw it on the ground, and have a new one regenerate, and bing, bang, boom, eight gates is over. And honestly, I can't see a problem with that. So yes, is employing a murderous sociopath to do your village's dirty deeds the best idea? No. But has Kodala already been doing it for decades? Absolutely. But let's also not sit here and act like Konoha has always been the beacon of light of morality when they have a literal head of torture in a beaky. Since we're talking about taking the members of the Akatsuki and having them be born somewhere else, next up on the list, we have Nagato. Nagato was obviously born in the Hidden Rain. As opposed to being born in the Hidden Rain, I'm proposing that Nagato be born quite literally anywhere else. See, when Nagato was born, he had about five good years in the Hidden Rain with his two parents, who were doctors, until the Second Great Shinobi World War found its way into the Hidden Rain and basically destroyed the entire village, killing both of his parents. Specifically, two Konoha Shinobi looking for food killed both of his parents, thinking they were enemy combatants, starting the seed of the thought that Konoha was the true place of evil in Nagato's mind forever. And honestly, if I watched two people from a specific place kill my parents in front of my five-year-old eyes, I'd probably think, the same thing. However, if Nagato was born anywhere that wasn't the Hidden Rain, he never would have run into the problem of watching his parents get slaughtered in front of him. He also, on top of being an orphan, wouldn't have grown up in a war-torn village, led by a power-hungry dictator who would go on to kill some of his closest friends in order to hold on to the semblance of power he still had. If Nagato was born in the Hidden Stone, or Konoha, or the Hidden Sand, or basically anywhere else, there's a lot of things he wouldn't have to deal with. Now, the real question becomes though, however, if Nagato was born anywhere outside of the Hidden Rain, would he have been given the Rinnegan by Madara? See, the reason that Madara gave Nagato the Rinnegan is because he needed somebody with massive chakra reserves that could possibly be manipulated down the line in order to hold on to his Rinnegan for him. He couldn't give them to Obito because Obito wouldn't be able to handle both of them simultaneously. And thus he gave his Rinnegan to somebody who could handle his Rinnegan in a war tour area that might be able to be manipulated by Obito down the line. Thus, not only making somebody who can control the ghetto statue, but also somebody who could move the Eye of the Moon plan forward for him while he was, I guess, sort of dead. However, if Nagato was born quite literally anywhere else, there is still the possibility that Madara would have given him the Rinnegan. But if Madara had given Nagato the Rinnegan if he was born in somewhere like, oh, I don't know, Konoha, Madara would have been running the risk of making an incredibly powerful enemy down the line. See, Madara was trying to destroy Konoha, giving the Rinnegan to somebody who was born in Konoha probably would have gone against his plan. Well, it is still a possibility that Obito could have manipulated Nagato while he lived inside of Konoha, God knows Orochimaru did it to Sasuke, it would have been a much harder and much more dangerous task. Since the Hidden Rain Village was kind of a lawless area, it wasn't hard for Obito to get his hands on or the attention of Nagato. And honestly, the same mentality could be applied to anywhere that's not Konoha. Now, if hypothetically Nagato was born in the Hidden Mist, problems probably would have arisen because it was the Blood Mist Village and also Madara and Obito were basically controlling the Mist Village from the shadows. So when it really boils down to it, if Nagato was born in any of the five major villages that weren't the Hidden Mist Village, he probably would have lived a relatively average life. He simply would have just been one of the last Uzumaki. He would have just been another shinobi with a massive amount of chakra, possibly the mind's eye of the Kagura, adamantite ceiling chains. He would have been like Kushina without the Kurama bit. Or with the Kurama bit. See, if Nagato was born in Konoha, he most likely would have been elected to be the next Jinchuriki of Kurama. And any village he was born into would have been insane to not elect him to be a Jinchuriki. Because after all, that's basically what the Uzumaki were used for in Konoha, being the perfect candidates for Jinchuriki. And as a Jinchuriki, he probably would have been the strongest one. Having Uzumaki chakra pools on top of a tailed beast chakra pools would have been insane. But if Madara did end up giving him the Rinnegan while he lived in one of these major villages, he probably wouldn't have become a Jinchuriki. That just feels like too many things to throw at a child, but either way, Nagato would have had a much better life and therefore been much harder to manipulate and probably would have just become a powerful ally for the allied shinobi forces in the fourth great shinobi world war. Are gone or not? The real question to me becomes, if not Nagato, then who? When we're talking about the Rinnegan. And honestly, I think Madara probably would have just given one of the Rinnegan to Obito and put the other in a glass jar. Or maybe he would have taken a shot at Kushina. Either are very legitimate and interesting possible plot lines. I think I'm gonna do a whole video on what if Nagato was born in Konoha. And once again, let's keep this whole what if Akatsuki members were born in different villages vibe rolling with what if Kisame was born in the Hidden Cloud. I know what you're saying. Kisame is a literal shark. He specializes in water releases. Why would he be born in the Hidden Cloud? That doesn't make any sense. And while fair, give me a second to explain. As we all know, Kisame is one of the most powerful members of the Akatsuki and one of the most powerful Kenjutsu users 
in Naruto's history. He is inarguably the strongest wielder of Samehada ever. Yes, Kisame is stronger than Killer B. But Kisame is also a very interesting character, especially when it comes to members of the Akatsuki, because Kisame's motivations for joining the Akatsuki are a bit weird. I guess I would say it's a bit shallow comparatively to a lot of other members of the Akatsuki. See, Kisame was actually an incredibly loyal shinobi to the Hidden Mist. His sensei was Fuguki, the only surviving member of the Seven Swords and of the Mist that fought against Might Die, the original wielder of Samehata. Well, I guess not like original, but original before Kisame, the first that we know of. And one time, Kisame was assigned to protect two people that were carrying an important piece of intel for the Hidden Mist. However, he was told by Fuguki that if these two people should become captured, that Kisame should kill them so the information doesn't get out. And that's exactly what happens. Unfortunately, the two people carrying the important piece of information are cornered, and thus Kisame has to kill them. This goes to show just how loyal Kisame was to the village. He was willing to kill other shinobi in his village to protect its secrets. However, upon returning from said mission, Kisame realized that Fuguki was actually selling the hidden mist secrets for money. And thus Kisame killed Fuguki and took Samehara. However, upon seeing behind the veil of the Hidden Mist and realizing that there was a lot of lies that he was told and that he shouldn't feel faith towards this village, Kisame became disenfranchised with the way of shinobis and only really decided to join the Akatsuki because he believed that their mission would illuminate the lies of the world. In essence, really the only reason that Kisame ever joined the Akatsuki is because he was born in the Hidden Mist. You see, Kisame was born during the Blood Mist Village era. He was born in the era of the Hidden Mist when a specific sect of the Ambu was created called the Hunter Nin, whose only job was to hunt down ninja who have left the Hidden Mist. It was the bloodiest, most backstabbing, most lied-filled village in the entirety of Naruto while Kisame was there. It was the worst place that somebody who was blindly loyal could be born. However, the best place that somebody with the level of loyalty that Kisame has could be born is the Hidden Cloud. See, there's a reason that the Hidden Cloud has never had a member of the Akatsuki or been attacked by anybody from the Hidden Cloud. It's because the Hidden Cloud keeps to itself. It's because the Hidden Cloud has power and each other's backs. The third Raikage gave his life and fought 10,000 Shinobi for three straight days so the rest of his forces could retreat during the Third Great Shinobi World War. The fourth Raikage was so respected that he was elected the leader of the Allied Shinobi forces. Even other Kages during wars against the Hidden Cloud have had respect for the Hidden Cloud, like Minato when he came up against Killer B and A. I know Minato wasn't Kage at the time. Hidden Cloud is not only overall possibly the strongest village in Naruto, it's also the most secure. The only two real defectors from the Hidden Cloud were King Kaku and Ginkaku, and they might have been assigned to try to kill Tobirama the first time by the Hidden Cloud. While the Hidden Cloud has tried a bunch of underhanded schemes during Naruto's history, like the Hyuga incident, there's never been leaks. And because of that, I believe if Kisame was born there, I mean, people would have been curious as to why he's a shark, but he most likely never would have become disenfranchised with the Shinobi way. And he actually, more likely than not, probably would have just risen to be an incredible Shinobi for the Hidden Cloud. On top of the fact that the Hidden Cloud is probably the second most practiced Kenjutsu village out of all of the five major ones, with both Darui and Killer B being Kenjutsu geniuses. So to me, it seems like the perfect place for him to live. On top of the fact that everyone from the Hidden Cloud is massive, and so is Kisame. So besides the gales, it fit right in. But we're not quite done with the Katsuki members, at least in a pseudo fashion, because next up on our list, we have Karin. You see, Karin was born in the Land of Grass, a village with a story very similar to that of the Hidden Rain. A small village caught between very big villages that ended up being the battlegrounds for bigger villages to have their wars on. And Karin's story is oddly also very similar to that of Nagato's, in that during one of these wars, she became an orphan. Unfortunately, as a talented orphan, she was basically cannon fodder for Orochimaru. He's got like magnetic spidey senses when it comes to finding talented orphans. And because Karin was orphaned and then found by Orochimaru, Orochimaru, she became one of Orochimaru's helpers, and therefore she eventually joined Hebi slash Taka, where she would fall in love with Sasuke. And we all know that's pretty much the worst thing that can happen to somebody in the Naruto universe. However, if hypothetically Karin was born anywhere else but a small village that was going to get trampled on by bigger villages, she would have had a very different life. See, Karin isn't inherently evil. She was just taken under the wing of Orochimaru when she had nothing else. She was on the cusp of death, an orphan running around a war-scarred village. There was nowhere for her to go and nobody for her to trust, which is how Orochimaru managed to sneak into her life. And obviously, Karin doesn't have the worst life of all time. I mean, her experience with Orochimaru wasn't so bad. I mean, she still works with him in Boruto. Orochimaru never really did anything wrong to her. He was just curious about her Uzumaki bloodline and abilities. The only real problem that arise from her time with Orochimaru was Sasuke, using her like a med kit and stabbing her one time. However, Karin's life could have been substantially better elsewhere, specifically in Konoha. See, Karin has 
top five chakra reserves in the entirety of Naruto. She was able to fill Tsunade's entire Byakuya seal in one bite. Mind you, that is years of accumulated chakra for Tsunade, who's half Senju. Karin is able to use adamantite chains. She is mind eye of the Kagura. And more than anything, if you bite her, she can heal you. Her life force is inarguably one of the highest in Naruto. And while she was able to achieve a lot while being Orochimaru's underling, I can't help but think about what she could have accomplished if she was hypothetically trained by Tsunade. See, Karin's healing prowess is next level just by having people bite her. And obviously, to be a good medical Koinichi, you have to have incredible chakra control. But if Karin was able to learn Tsunade's level of chakra control with her amount of chakra, she would have been stronger than Sakura, who's top five in Konoha right now. Not to mention, as an Uzumaki, she would inherently be perfect for the role of Jinchuriki. And not to mention, once again, if she was born in Konoha, there's a possibility that she could have hooked up with Naruto and they would have had 75% Uzumaki children. I'm not saying I want that. I love Naruto and Hinata together. It's just a possibility. And not to mention, if she was born in Konoha, more likely than not, her parents would still be alive. Because there's one place worse than being born in the Hidden Mist, and that's any small village. So it would have been cool to see Karin, possibly a Jinchuriki or possibly a medical Kunaichi. Either way, both circumstances would have been substantially better than falling in love with Sasuke. Because the only thing worse than being born in the Hidden Mist and a small village is being in love with Sasuke. But speaking of being in love with Sasuke, coming in at our last entry on this list, we have Orochimaru. Now, Orochimaru actually wasn't born in the Hidden Leaf. He, like Karin and Nagato, was an orphan, but he was an orphan that was found by Hiruzen. So Hiruzen brought him to the Hidden Leaf. Hiruzen then put him through the Shinobi Academy and then put Put him on his Genin team. Genin team of Orochimaru, Jiraiya, and Tsunade. And while for a while Konoha was a great place for Orochimaru to be, he didn't stay that way. See, Orochimaru was actually a pretty stand-up guy for a long time. I mean, he was brutish and he didn't like people a lot, but he wasn't evil. It wasn't until the Second Great Shinobi World War when Tsunade's brother was killed that Orochimaru started down the wrong path. See, one of the most widely forgotten facts about Naruto is that Tsunade's little brother was actually a part of Orochimaru's Genin squad. And upon realizing that Tsunade was both powerless to fix Dan and her little brother, Orochimaru started the quest to master every single jutsu known to man. However, unfortunately, you could not accomplish this with one lifetime, so Orochimaru had to figure out immortality first. And that unfortunately took him even further down the wrong path. Orochimaru Orochimaru began human experimentations with his curse mark and Hashirama cells to replicate wood release. He began trying to find ways to switch his consciousness into new bodies to extend his life, all the while killing, quite literally, hundreds of children. And the thing is, in Konoha, that's a little frowned upon. I mean, not really, because Orochimaru is implied to have been working with Donzo, but even that had to be done in the dark. And because this was done in the dark, people began to get curious about all these missing children. Until eventually, Hiruzen actually stumbles upon Orochimaru's lab, and Hiruzen drives Orochimaru out of the village. This leads Orochimaru to have a deep-seated hatred for Konoha, and thus a want to destroy it. Which leads Orochimaru to the Akatsuki because he wants Itachi as a vessel, leads to the Konoha crush, and basically Orochimaru's entire character arc. However, there's places where human experimentation is not frowned upon. Most specifically, the Hidden Mist. Killing children isn't frowned upon in the Hidden Mist. In fact, it was a pastime for a couple of decades. The Blood Mist Village saw more bloodshed amongst children than the Forest of Death. People like Zabaza killing his entire graduating class from the Ninja Academy and becoming the only graduate. If Orochimaru was born into the Hidden Mist, where he'd probably be more comfortable because if they're shark people, surely they can be snake people. Even in this circumstance, if he began down the path of trying to find all jutsus and immortality, he could have experimented in peace. In fact, the Mizokage probably would have hired him. Orochimaru most likely would have been weaponized by the Hidden Mist and probably turned into the Mizukage at one point or another. I mean, we all know that Orochimaru can run a village, the village hidden in the sound, which is a real, actual village nowadays, mind you. So while Orochimaru's character arc did finish with him back in Konoha working collaboratively with Naruto, collaboration between the powers that be and Orochimaru would have happened substantially faster if he was in the Hidden Mist. And in fact, more likely than not, Orochimaru probably would have got more done in the Hidden Mist and faster. Because one, he wouldn't be on the run from the Akatsuki because he never would have been driven out of the village. And two, he wouldn't have to switch from hideout to hideout all the time. He would just have an infinite flow of people to work on that the Hidden Mist would feed him. He probably would have been immortal before Naruto was even born. And that's it. All the people that I believe were born into the wrong villages. Who else do you guys think could have possibly been born into the wrong village? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Listen, I'm not saying I want Orochimaru to do more human experimentation. I'm just saying he would have had a better situation for it in the Hidden Mist.